Yeah, I know some folks have a problem with telling jokes in church, but I believe the Bible says laughter do good, do it good like a like a medicine. Amen. You should tell jokes once in a while. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> These are not mine. If you want to blame anybody, blame blame Mike. He's the one who gave you the book. So, I was looking through here, and I know my daughter appreciated it because we kind of share the same sense of humor. She won't she won't even send she won't even send stuff to her mom. That's funny, but she sends it to me. She knows she knows I can appreciate it. All right, ready? Just a few, just to kind of lighten us up a little bit for the word. Sea captains don't like crew cuts. <laughs> All right. Reading while sunbathing makes you well read. <laughs> when two egotists meet, it's an eye for an eye. A bicycle can't stand on its own because it's too tired. Uh, a backward poet writes in verse. A chicken crossing the road is poultry in action, in motion. Oh, here's, here's the last one. Show me a piano falling down a mine shaft, and I'll show you a flat miner. <laughs> okay, that's all. We just ate up five minutes there. <laughs> all right. But also, if you have Facebook, you'll, you'll notice what I, I put on there. Five sayings, top five sayings that are not in the Bible. So let me just uh, add this up front. If you don't agree with what I say, that's perfectly okay. You just go home, get your Bible open, and you and you find out why you believe what you believe. You might just find out you're believing a traditional belief when, in fact, it's not in the Bible. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at today. So uh, you can you can disagree with me, but for your own sake, find out why you disagree with me. Okay. So I always say, don't believe anything just because I say it, but let it challenge you to study the Word for yourself, to find out why. And you know, I've known people, I've been in this 30 years, and there's been times where people say, well, I just don't believe that, I just don't believe that. I say, well, why don't you believe it? Well, that's just not the way I believe. Well, why is that not the way you believe? Well, that's just the way I always believed. Okay, so that's not good enough, amen? We, we need to be able to go to the Word and say, and that's what I always try to do, is go to the Word and say, this is why I believe what I believe. It's not good enough just know what you believe, but you need to know why you believe what you believe. Amen? Amen. So here they are. I'm not going, by the way, I'm not going to touch on all five of these. I'm only going to preach on one. And, and we visited all these at one time or another, but it's just been a long time. And next Sunday, I'm, I'm not big on committing myself to long series because you know, I want to kind of change it up. So I wanted to get this in before I committed myself to the book of Acts because it's going to take a while. But the good news is, even though we're saying the book of Acts, we'll be all over the Bible. We'll be covering a lot of different subjects, okay? Uh, the book of Acts will be our springboard uh, each Sunday. So it's not like we're going to be just narrowing in on one area. We'll be talking about a lot of different things. There's ten great stories in the book of Acts that we'll be looking at as well. Okay, here they are. Number five. God answers in His time, not yours. You know, for the most Part, God's already answered your prayers. Just a matter of receiving. Amen? Number four. This is a good one. Cleanliness is next to Godliness. Godliness. Not in there. Not in there. Number three. God helps those that help themselves. Not in there. God helps us when we're helpless. Amen? Amen? Number two. Money is the root of all evil. Again, not in there. What is it? The love of money is the root of all evil. And number one, God will not put more on you than you can handle. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. That state originated from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So look with me or turn with me there as I read. No temptation. Everybody say temptation. temptation. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be what? Tempted. tempted 
beyond what you are able, but with temptation will make the way of escape that you may be able to yeah. bear. Now that is where God will not put more on you than you can handle comes from. So we're going to take a close look at this verse this morning. Now although this word temptation comes from a Greek word which can be translated trial, adversity, here in this context we'll see is talking about temptation. I also looked this verse up in about a dozen uh, different translations and 10 out of 12 translate that word temptation. Now, the first 12 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 are talking about the children of Israel. And it's talking about how they gave in to temptation. And the writer here is admonishing them not to go the way the Israelites went. He's saying don't do what they did. Don't give in to temptation is what he is saying. He's encouraging us right here at Crosswalk Fellowship that the temptations we face are not uncommon. You know, sometimes the enemy will try to make you feel like you're all alone in that temptation. And no one's ever had that thought before. No one's ever been tempted to do this before. I'm the only one. It makes you feel isolated and it makes you feel like you can never possibly overcome that temptation. But he's trying to tell you, hey, Others have been tempted the same way, and they have overcome that temptation. So we have to remember that we can overcome. Amen? God is faithful. God is not here to hinder you. He's here to help you. Amen? Amen. A lot of folks look at God like He's throwing all kinds of stumbling blocks in front of them, trying to hinder them. Oh, God's, uh, the Holy Spirit has come along beside to help you. Amen? To, to aid you. He's here to direct you, not to dissect you. See, a lot of people have a picture of God as just putting you on the operating table and just dissecting you. Let's see how you do without this. You know, like take this organ out of you, see how long you can make it. And also, God is here to protect you, not to prove you. You know, we sometimes think God's put us through tests all these times to prove us. Oh, God knows everything about you. Amen. Actually, He wants to prove Himself. He wants to prove Himself faithful. Everybody just say, God is faithful. God is faithful. How is God faithful? Well, here's the key. He puts limits on the tempter. Now, who's the tempter? Satan. Amen? God is not the tempter. Matter of fact, in James 1.13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. So, God's not the one that tempts us. Amen? Amen. This comes back to free will. You know, Satan even has free will. Some folks think Satan doesn't have a free will, but the only thing Satan does is what God has him to do. Well, Satan is not God's church trainer. A lot of times people look at it that way, like, you know, all, you know everything that happens, God wants to happen. I, I do not see that in the Bible, and I don't see that as being, uh, uh, I mean, you know, to tell me that, and some folks will argue with you, you know, you know your, your sister gets raped and beaten, left for dead. Well, you know, God, God had a purpose for it. I, I, you know, we're reading a lot into that that's not in the Word of God. And those of you who've been around long enough have heard a lot of different uh, teachings on that. Well, what about Job? Well, we talked about Job. You know, sometimes we read a lot into Job that's not really there. Well, what about Paul's thorn in the flesh? Well, you know, that was messenger sent from Satan. And uh, His grace is sufficient. Amen. I mean, He doesn't always remove the enemy. Amen. The enemy attacks and attacks. But His grace is sufficient. Amen. So, uh, uh, Satan is not just doing God's bidding. And, and you know, you have a free will. God created us with a free will. You're not a puppet on a string where God's just pulling all the strings and making you do this and not letting you do that or no, we had free wills. That's, that's how we got into this mess in the first place. Amen? Yeah. Because Adam had a free will. He had a choice. Yeah. Now, Flip Wilson had it wrong. First of all, how many don't know who Flip Wilson is? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Look it up on YouTube, okay? 
Flip Wilson was a black actor that, a comedian that uh, uh, was also Geraldine, is that right? He, he, Geraldine, he dressed up like a woman. And, and uh, but anyway, he had a famous saying back in the day, the devil made me do it. Well, he was wrong. The devil didn't make him do it, amen? The devil can tempt you, but the devil can't make you sin. God will not allow... Let me just back up a moment. Again, we had this free will. Satan can tempt you. He will tempt you. But again, as part of free will, you have a choice. You can resist or you can submit to temptation. But he limits Satan. It's, that's what he's talking about here. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to resist. In other words, he will not allow the devil to make you sin. Again, you've got to understand, we're talking about temptation. This whole chapter is talking about temptation. It's not talking about trials and tests and tribulation and, and all that kind of stuff. It's talking about temptation. So, he'll not allow you to be tempted among, uh, above beyond what you're able to resist. Now, the word actually goes uh, what you're able to bear. Okay, So let's take a look at that word bear for just a moment. Um, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. That word bear comes from the Greek word dunamis. That's where we get the word power from. Okay? So He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your power. Which means we have power to resist temptation. Isn't that good news? You have power to to resist temptation. The devil cannot make you sin. You know, I have power to resist a certain amount of pressure. Let's say I can lift 250 pounds. I have power to lift 250 pounds. But if you put 500 pounds on me, I'm crushed. Because I, I'll be honest with you, I know you look at these guns right here, and you think, my goodness, you probably lift 600 pounds. No, I'll tell you, I don't know if I can do 250, but I'll tell you, that'd be my limit for sure. Okay? Now, you put 500 pounds on me, I'm done. I'm crushed. And what, what the devil, or what God is saying is, He will not allow the devil to put 500 pounds of temptation pressure on you. Whatever you're tempted with, you can resist. Because He cannot make you do it. So whatever you're tempted, don't think this is impossible to overcome. I can overcome it because I have been given power to overcome. I can bear it. I have power to overcome it. That's why it says in Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Isn't that good news? Yes. Now I know it's not popular to talk about sin nowadays. We're not, to, we're not to pay any attention to sin. Sin doesn't matter to God anymore. Yes, sin does matter. We've been forgiven. I thank God for grace. But sin still matters. We still need to live a life of holiness before Him. Amen? And He's given us power to do it. You'll find out that's a big reason for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's power. Amen? Power to be witnessed and also power to overcome. However, in order to receive that power, we have to be plugged into the power source. And His name is Jesus. Amen. With temptation, it says, He will make a way of escape. He will provide a way out. That's the good news. When you're being tempted, look for a way out. Don't look at the temptation. Start looking for a way out. It's there. You see, when you look for a way out, it changes your focus. You're focusing on how do I not do this rather than I'm going to do this. We're told in the case of fire to have an escape plan. Amen? So everybody, look at me. If there's a fire by that door, go out that door. Amen? If there's a fire by this door, go out that door. That's our escape plan. All right? Don't run into the fire. Run away from the fire. You know, if you have a drinking problem or had a drinking problem, don't hang out in bars. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we've all heard that old saying, take a cold shower. 
If you're single and alone in a certain place and your hormones get out of whack, excuse yourself and get out of there. Amen? Amen. I know a guy that used to, you know, have a, a, a lot of women in his life. And I won't go any further than that. I think we're all adults in here, but I still won't go any further than that. And I remember, you know, he hadn't been saved very long and he was with a young lady. He started getting temptation. The hormones started getting out of whack and he just got up and took off running. Sometimes you just got to run. It says, flee the very appearance. Amen? There's a way out. Go home and take a cold shower. That's your way out. That changes your focus. Amen? If you're finding you're tempted at a certain place or a certain time, change it up a little bit. Find a way out. When that thought crosses your mind, take it captive. That's what it tells us to do. Take it captive at the gate. Don't let it in. In other words, don't entertain those thoughts. You see, sometimes we think that, that every time a thought crosses our mind, that's sin. That's not true. That's temptation. It's what you do with that thought. You cannot sometimes help those thoughts. And the best thing to do is live close to Jesus. Amen? You know, they said about the disciples, they could tell they'd been with Jesus. I heard a guy say the other day, and I'll say the same thing. It is impossible for me to commit adultery today. But you can't say that, Pastor. Yes, I can. It's impossible for me to commit adultery today. Now, a year from now, I can't tell you that. I mean, if I start falling away from God and start doing different things and whatever, whatever, if I allow myself to get into a position like that, you know, it says not to think yourself more high than you ought. But today, where I'm at with my relationship with God and my wife, it's impossible. you could not pay me. You could not make me do it. And I'm assuming I'm going to be the same way next year. But i got to wait until next year to say it again. Amen? You see, you can't make you sin. He can't make you sin. The devil can't make you do it. You make a choice. God has given you power to redirect your thoughts. Victory is yours to claim over temptation. Look with you uh, to Genesis 39, verse 11. And we'll look at verse 11 and 12. But it happened about this time. When Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand. And listen, what did he do? Fled and ran outside. You see, that? that's, a, that's biblical, isn't it? He just took off running. He got out of there. See, Joseph made a decision a long time ago to live a pure life. He could have tried to justify it. He was a young man after all. And, and, and she was coming on to him. Well, what am I supposed to do? She was coming on to me. He could have blamed God for being in Egypt in the first place. Well, God, you would have kept me out of this place. I wouldn't be in this position. No, God took advantage of his situation and put him in great positions, didn't he? he? She had a physical grip on him. He could have said, I'm trapped. What am I to do? But instead, he saw his way of escape. He tore away from her and ran. Sometimes the best thing to do is to run. Flee the very appearance of evil. Amen. Well, a social drink won't hook me again. Come on. A glance, a pornography on the internet, it won't captivate me again. Flee the very appearance of evil. So again, this verse does not even remotely say that God won't put more on you than you can handle. Nor does it say that anywhere in scriptures. Find it. I know you may have said it. I've said it, I'm sure, before. But if you really go to the Bible, that's not what it says. And that were the case, many people say, oh, yes, you do, God. <laughs> you put more on me. I can't handle any of this. But the point is that it's not God doing it. Amen? I challenge you the next time to realize who the enemy is. Yes. Matter of fact, let's go there. John 10.10. 10. A thief does not come but to steal and to kill and to destroy. 
Jesus said, but I have come that you might have what? Life and that more abundantly. If it has to do with stealing, killing, destroying, who's the author? If it has to do with life and that more abundant, Jesus. Amen? That kind of divides it right down the middle, right there in one verse. In James 4, 7, take a look there with me. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist, you know what that word means? It means to fight actively. Don't just give in, but stand up and fight. When temptation comes to you, stand up and fight with the Word of God. Amen? See, if you believe God's making you sick, if you believe God is the one causing you to lose your job and making your teenagers rebellious, cause your spouse to leave you, well, submit to it then, amen? If it's God, submit to it. Don't fight it. But if you know that it's not God, then you resist it. You stand up and fight against it, amen? I figure, you know, if we believe God's doing that to us, we ought to be great people of faith. So, well, God, after I learned my lesson, I know you're going to lift it, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to go to the hospital. I'm not going to go to the doctor because if this is you making me sick, I'm not going to fight you. I'll just submit to it. But if it's the devil, God, I submit to you. But devil, I resist you. I stand up and fight against you. You will not steal my health. You know, we're the hill. He's trying to steal our health. Amen. We're the blessed that he's trying to put into poverty. We're not the sick trying to get healed or the poor trying to get rich. We've got to realize who we are in him. You know, if it is God, I think we would at least, he would at least have the decency to tell us uh, uh, who, who, who's doing it. To tell us he's doing it. And why he's doing it. You know, when my kids were young and I punished them, I didn't do it secretly. They didn't have to guess who was punishing them. Dad was doing it, amen? Or mom was doing it. And we also told them why we're doing it. Some people believe that God's putting them through the ringer and they don't know, you know why he's doing it. I mean, if we did something wrong, if your kids do something wrong, do you just, or do you just go punish them? Why are you doing that? You don't need to know. No, we're, we're doing it so they know not to do it again. Amen? There's a reason for that. You know, somebody that everything that happens to you is the plan of God, they, they say he's working on the bigger picture and, and all these bad things are to bring about the bigger picture. But Romans 8.28 is a verse that many people will use for that. Let's take a look at Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now, it doesn't say that all things come from God and work together. It just says all things work together. And God will work all things together. It doesn't mean that He's the author of the bad things. He will just take the bad things and work them together for good. But He puts qualifications on it. He says, for those that love God. Sorry, if you don't love God, this scripture does not apply to you. It's true. We have a tendency to apply all scripture to everybody. But there are many scriptures that have qualifiers. And this is one of them. It doesn't always work that way for everybody. For example, in Philippians 4.19, it reads, And my God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That does not apply to everybody. He has set up spiritual laws of sowing and reaping. If you sow plentifully, you will reap plentifully. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. In context, that's a word that sometimes we forget to pay attention to. What's it talking about? Who's he talking to? Listen to this. In context, he's talking to those that were financially supporting his ministry. That's the group of people that he was talking to. He said previously that there are some churches that did not give anything. There are some churches that gave once, but he's talking to the church of Philippi, and he said, you gave more. And this is who he's talking to. 
And he said that it wasn't the gift that he was after, but he wanted them to receive the fruit that abounds to their account. You know, when we get up here and, and uh, you know, we're all family, and I said a while back, I'm not going to apologize for asking for money because this is not my church, this is our church. Amen? Now, we rarely talk about money. Amen? We rarely, but that's really a disservice to you because just as Paul said, he, he doesn't do it that he might get your gift, he does it that you might be in a position to be blessed. So when we do get up, we do talk about, you know, well, we, you know, we had a $1,300 utility bill the other day. $1,300. It normally runs about three to 400 But we tried an experiment by leaving it on, trying to, it didn't work. And then last month was over $500. That's just utilities. We have a, a $1,700 or something like that insurance bill come up in July. Yes, there are needs. And you know how those needs are met? By our giving. Amen? Now, although that's true, that's not the only reason we talk about money. It's not the only reason we give. We give because it's a biblical principle. And God blesses us through that. Amen? It's called stewardship. It's, it's realizing that everything that we have belongs to Him anyway. Amen? And again, we've already taken the offering up. <laughs> I, I do one preacher. He got up and preached 45 minutes, maybe longer than that. And Cheryl thought it was about over. I said, no, that's just to take the offering up. <laughs> no, it isn't. Sure enough, 45 minutes. And then he preached an hour and a half. So you don't know how good you had it. <laughs> And he didn't preach as good as I do. <laughs> All right, let's get back to it. So, so this church, he said, to the church of Philippi, he said, now my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So back to Romans 8. It only works for the good for those that what? Love God. Love God. And those, listen, here's the second part. A call according to his purpose. So what is his purpose? Amen? If you're called according to his purpose, what is his purpose? 1 John 3 8. Listen to this. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this what? Purpose, the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. What are we called to? To destroy the works of the devil. That's being called according to his purpose. We are to destroy the works of the devil. God manifested his son to destroy the works of the devil. That's his purpose. And all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Those that are walking in this calling. Those who are resisting the devil and are out to destroy his works and living for God can say, regardless of what comes my way, regardless of what the enemy does in my life, I know that God can and God will turn it around for the good. You see, that's the hope you have. Amen? It's not God's causing this. No, God's purpose is to destroy the works of the devil which are working on you. Amen. The thief comes not but to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came to destroy all that that you might have life and that more abundant. Church, that's good news. Somebody needs somebody to say amen. Amen. God is active in our lives but He doesn't control everything in our lives. He has given us a free will to make choices. And that's good and bad. The good part is we have a free will. We can choose to love Him or not love Him. That's our choice. Amen? The bad is, sometimes we don't make such good choices. And most of the time, when we experience bad things, are because of our bad choices. Most of the time. I talked to a young man a couple years ago that, you know, his life was derailed. And he's going to go try to make a new start. And I said, if you want a different tomorrow, make different choices today. 
make different decisions today. I mean, I tried to drive that in. Well, I hadn't seen him for a year and a half, and I see him, same old, same old. Still crying about it. I want to say just shut up. But I'm a pastor. I'm full of compassion. I can't do those kind of things. But, you know, I, I'm being real. Amen. You just want to go slap. Make better choices. But, oh, you're just an old man. Hey, I made a lot, I made plenty of bad choices in my life. Even after becoming a Christian, I made bad choices. And I probably still will make bad choices. But I'm open to receive wisdom from others. Amen. I'm open to receive counsel. There's, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Amen. And there, rarely do I ever make a big decision that I don't talk to several people about it before I make it. Because I want their input. Amen. You know, my, I have a board here, Tom and Mike, which, uh, you know, I discuss things with. But I also have a board of three other pastors that I'm accountable to. And uh, I also con consult them when I make big decisions concerning the church. We'll talk and I'll talk to the others as we believe God to guide us in different choices. Amen. So, a lot of times our problems are because of bad choices. Deuteronomy 30. In verse 19. And it reads there, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. And I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Now he set a choice before them, but he even says, I'm going to give you a little wisdom here, guys. Choose life. And how many know God does that to us? But we choose death. Amen? We choose to give in to temptation. God created the earth. We set laws in motion, both physical and physical laws. And He gives us a choice. You know, if you jump off a roof, that's your choice. Every single one of you today can go climb on a roof somewhere and jump off. You have a choice. You could do that. But why in the world would you want to? If you want to jump off a roof, spiritually speaking, you can do that. That's your choice. But there are consequences to our choices. Amen? Or it may be someone else who has free will causing you grief. Unfortunately, that happens too. Amen? Yeah, that's true. Sometimes we suffer because of other people's choices. You know, you have like the Columbine shooting and the different things that, that go on. God did not ordain that. You have the Twin Towers. God did not ordain that. That was not, not God's choice. That was an enemy somewhere that made that choice and it affected other people. See, other people can sometimes cause grief. And sometimes it's just a direct attack from the enemy. Because he comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But never are we to blame God. Because we are told in the Word of God that God is not the one that's attacking us. He's not the author of the bad things in your life. Matter of fact, James 1.7, we'll close with this. In James 1.7, it says, For let not that man suppose that he... Well, that's not what I want. One, well, I got the wrong verse. It's every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Amen? And we need to realize that God is a good God. God's not here to give you a hard time. God's here to help you overcome. But we do have an enemy. His name is Satan. And he is out to steal, kill, and to destroyed. But greater is He that is in you, amen, than He that is in the world. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank You that You are such a loving, graceful, merciful God. We thank You, Lord, that we, according to Your Word, are the apple of Your eye. 
And Lord, we thank you that you love us even when we do mess up. We thank you that you have forgiven us. And we thank your word, Father, that your word says if we confess our sin, you are faithful. And just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Father, I pray for your people this morning. Father, if uh, there's any of us that have given in to temptation, I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your cleansing. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to renew our mind. That the next time the enemy comes with that temptation, Lord, that we would know there's a way of escape. And we would begin to look for that route. And Lord, we just thank you for providing a way. And we thank you, God, for loving us and caring for us. And Father, we thank you that uh, your plans for us are good and not evil. And we're just careful to give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.